So the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. We read the sermon scripture at the beginning of the service. So rather than reread it now, we'll just sort of walk our way through the passage together as we go through the sermon. Our daughter, Grace, will turn 27 on Tuesday, which just blows my mind. But when she was little, when she was three or four years old and she didn't understand something, she would say, so what? And, and it sounded at first like she was being rude or disrespectful. And we kind of didn't know what to do, but we finally figured out that she was genuinely curious. She, she wanted to know, so what is important about this? So what's the impact of this? So what happens next? So when we say the Lord is risen and we respond with he is risen indeed, I think a good next thing to ask is so what? The same way our daughter would ask. So let's try to get at the so what of the resurrection. The why does this matter part. Mary is the first one at the tomb. And she finds that Jesus' body is gone. She runs to tell the disciples, Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, most likely John, they literally race to the tomb. John wins the race and looks into the tomb and confirms what Mary said. Peter arrives and, you know, not being Peter and not one to stop at the entrance like the other two, he barges right on in. They see the wrappings from the body, the scripture tells us John believes, and they leave. They go home. We aren't told exactly what John believed or why they left, just that they did. But verse 11 tells us, but Mary stood weeping. Mary was grieving openly, deeply, She's desperate for some clarity, some way to make sense of this. She had come to the tomb to grieve, and she finds it empty. The only logical conclusion that she can come to is that it's a case of body snatching, grave robbery. Because dead people then and now pretty much stay that way. Mary knew that. And people were much more in close contact with death in that world than we are today. People knew what death felt like and looked like and smelled like. Mary's not stupid. She knows that death is real. She watched Jesus die, after all. She knows he's dead. So finding his tomb empty just added a level of gut-wrenching horror and misery to her already overwhelming grief. For observant Jews, the dead are unclean, especially after three days. Mary's only conclusion, her only assumption is someone has stolen Jesus's body, which means his body is being disrespected and desecrated, and she wants to make it right. She wants to return Jesus's body to his grave and let him rest in peace. <laughs> but I think there's another deeper level to her grief and her shock at finding his body gone. See, Jesus talked about a new kingdom, a new order where love rules, where justice is the norm, where new life is really, really possible. And here she is facing the fact that not only is Jesus dead, but all traces of him are gone. For Mary, as one author put it, everything she is seeing and experiencing points to the idea that Jesus' promises, like the tomb, are empty. We can relate, can't we? Do we not at one time or another have moments when all the stuff we're counting on seems to be non-existent. When the stuff we stand on seems to be too fragile for what life is throwing at us. No wonder Mary weeps. Her tears matter. 
She cries the tears we all cry when it seems that the power of darkness are winning. When the ugliness of human cruelty blots out the light of what's good in this world. When justice seems like a daydream. The gospel writer mentions Mary's tears four times. And we get it. We weep for these things too. This last Sunday, in the aftermath of the flooding that impacted so many of our neighbors, so many of you, there were a lot of tears. There were tears at the trauma of having to flee for their lives in the middle of the night. Tears of gratitude that it wasn't worse. Tears of just being overwhelmed and at the magnitude of the cleanup. And tears of appreciation for neighbors and family and friends pitching in to help. It's good to know in the midst of our own weeping, God cares very much about our tears too. God doesn't banish or ignore our tears. God's intention is to be with us in the midst of them and to be with us as we see through Christ what is possible after the tears. So Mary turns around and she sees Jesus, but she thinks he's the gardener in charge of the garden. He asks her why she's weeping and who she's looking for. And the first words we hear from the resurrected Christ are concern for Mary's tears. Just let that sink in a moment. The first words of the risen Lord are words that acknowledge and give dignity to Mary's pain. He asks who she's looking for and she explains again her quest. And then there is this most tender of moments. He speaks her name, and she knows it's him. She gets it. She cries out, Rabbani, meaning teacher. She's overjoyed and probably more than a little shocked. The fact that Jesus is alive and not dead probably hits Mary like a ton of bricks. And I'm guessing that she, like the rest of us who follow Jesus, spent the rest of her life realizing what else the resurrection means. It means that the framework of death is shattered. It means that the God who is incarnate in Jesus Christ is more than any grave can contain. Death, which we think of as that most final of circumstances, it no longer has the last word. It means that through Jesus' encounter with and victory over death, death is conquered for all of us, too. The resurrection means that this day, which Mary expected to be all about death and endings and an aching, empty heart, was transformed. And now, now it's about the empty tomb and about life and all the days to come are, too. This risen Jesus was not just a rabbi with a vision for a new, one, <clears throat> new way of doing things. This risen Jesus is God incarnate, alive, present, through and beyond the grave. Jesus Christ is present, cares about us, speaks our names, even when we don't recognize him. And truth be told, we often don't recognize him. One of the hard things about faith is the faith part, that we can't always see what God is up to. Remembering this scene gives us a way to remind ourselves that even when we don't see it, God's up to a lot, loving us, conquering death, conquering darkness, and calling us by name. Jesus calls Mary by her name because it's in a relationship that we start to get it like Mary did. But it's not a relationship of equals. It's a relationship between we who are mortal and the God of creation. It's a relationship between we who are broken and who break things and the one who makes things all whole and new. 
And Jesus gives Mary a job to go tell his disciples this very good news, that Jesus is risen, that death is dead. All the promises he made, all the stuff he said, it's all true, truer than they could ever have imagined. Now in the early centuries of the church, Mary Magdalene was called the apostle to the apostles since she was the one sent to tell them about the resurrection. You know, in those days, a woman's testimony wasn't even allowed in court. Yet Jesus sends this woman to be the first to announce that everything had changed. How cool is that? And again, we see it is all about relationship. He tells Mary, I'm going to my father and your father, my God and your God. In other words, he's inviting all his followers into the relationship he himself has with God. He invites us to make ourselves at home in this relationship, to know that we're accepted, invited in, welcomed, just as we are. There are no preconditions. This is the whole purpose of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. To welcome us into that relationship, into that discipleship, into that new life. Being a disciple means being sent, like Mary, to do the joyful work of Easter. The work of Easter is this, that we, like Mary, known by name, are sent into the world to demonstrate that death doesn't win, love wins, and that all of us and each of us are fiercely loved, and that when we act as agents of that love, it can and does transform us and all this weary world. So that's the so what of Easter. The reason that when we say Christ is risen, the right and proper answer is, he is risen indeed. So Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.